the late Alvin Guldner was uh, often described as a renegade sociologist. It was in fact a self-professed ridge rider between two disciplines. On the one hand, traditional academic sociology, and on the other, uh, critical Marxist social theory, the sort of social theory we find in such contemporary figures as Jürgen Habermas and before him in the Frankfurt School. Now, in his early work, Guldner had been concerned to use or deploy uh, uh, critical Marxism in order to uncover the ideological biases, not only of academic sociology, but of so-called value-free social science in general, to show its one-sided distortions, to show the way in that it, uh, when it characterized a social structure as functional, it assumed that that functioning was, in fact, adequate to human needs and the human situation. Uh, and taking things as given, it made them sac sacrosanct. But in his later career, he offered turnabout by um, deploying a Marxist critique of Marxism itself. And he did this in a remarkable trilogy of books written in the late 1970s called, and I love the title, The Dark Side of the Dialectic. And it's these three rather slim texts. Um, and what he does is he applies the techniques of Marxist ideological critique to Marxism as an ideology itself. And in so doing, he practices, well, he becomes what he calls a Marxist outlaw or outlaw Marxist. Um, what is an outlaw Marxist? An outlaw Marxist is a Marxist who doesn't belong to any particular establishment, employs Marxist methods, but in a way which is outside of the usual political concerns of Marxism. It applies Marxism's critiques against itself. Paradoxically, and I quote, a Marxist outlaw is a man of the law. He insists on using one law for all and believes that such consistency is essential to the justice he seeks. Specif specifically, he wishes to use the dialectic to study Marxism itself. It is precisely of this that he comes to be defined as an outlaw. For most Marxists, like most academic sociologists, reject the idea that they and their theories are the bearers of contradiction, false consciousness, and mystification. But perhaps what's most challenging about his outlaw Marxism and what's so exciting is he doesn't use it then to develop what is the true and desirable form of social theory, but he uses it in a form which is purely negative to show the flaws and contradictions even within Marxism uh, in a Marxist way. And as such, what he really is, as he himself says, is a Marxist Socratic or a Socratic Marxist. Being the critic of all positive doctrines, I'm quoting again, searching out their limits, the Socratic is necessarily suspect in the eyes of all who offer and all who ache for a positive doctrine. In the end, then, the establishment and those who aspire to succeed it, in other words, both the old and the young, will accuse him of poisoning the mind of the youth. Thus, Socratics are and are made outlaws. Clearly, however, Marxist outlaws have not surrendered the dialectic, but continue to probe and wander its dark side. Only those who can move without joining packaged tours of the world can afford such a journey. And I want to suggest that although it, uh, it's still not a widely read text, it's a greatly under, underappreciated uh, series of texts. His outlaw Socratic Marxism revolutionizes the way we think about society, politics, and the entire scope of world history. Well, the first uh, volume, The Dialectic of Ideology and Technology, focuses on precisely the historical conditions which give rise to ideology uh, and its uh, rational limits and possibilities. This is important because Marxism is both a scientific critique of ideologies and itself an ideology. Now, ideologies emerge in the modern period. In fact, the term is first coined um, in the Napoleonic era by Napoleon himself as a response to the breakdown of what we might call the discursive credit of traditional authorities. What does that mean? Before the epoch of modern politics, political decisions and commands in discourse was based on the credit we gave to authorities. Right? The traditional peasant would say, my priest is a priest. He's been to the university. He knows what's right. If he tells me that paying this particular tithe is correct, it's correct. Or this man is an aristocrat. He stands in a, position, a particular position within a traditional hierarchy. And he is in a position to know. And if he says A, then A is the case. And I simply trust him. 
or, or uh, as a result, you don't have a popular politics, you have a traditional politics. And, and that, that's what the idea of credit is. There are people whose statements you believe in advance of any uh, evidence they'll offer, simply because they are authorities. The modern epic destroys that. The American Revolution, the English Revolutions, and most importantly, the French Revolutions, destroy traditional authorities because those traditional authorities were the authorities of the Ancien Regime. They were aristocrats and clerics, both of whom are discredited. So the problem then becomes, what are we going to place in the, put in the place of this traditional credited speech? And the answer is a new and modern culture of rational discourse. What characterizes this new culture of rational discourse? Well, first, it claims that all assertions must be justified without reference to authority. Right? One cannot claim, well, this is my metaphysic, and it's true because I have a PhD, so <laughs> there it is. Uh, that simply won't do. You, you, you can't make a claim to be right simply because of who you are. I'm rich, therefore I know what I'm talking about. Secondly, all assent must be purely voluntary. Right? One does not get people to believe in a metaphysic at gunpoint or in a social theory at gunpoint. The ideal of rational discourse is that their assent must be voluntary. They must be persuaded. And finally, all the assumptions and inferences within a uh, political discourse or a public discourse must be made explicit. You can't hide the assumptions behind your doctrines. And you can't say, well, and there's a series of inferences that lead us here, but I, I have no time to get to them. You have to lay them out so we can all see. It's a, ge a sh game of show and tell. Now, ideology, like social science, and in fact, for that matter, like Marxism itself, all speak in this idiom of rational discourse. Right? They all follow these, these three rules, these canons of modern rationality. And therefore, ideology was, no matter how much people critique it, relatively rational. It was an advance on traditional forms of, of public discourse, of political discourse. Um, and ideologies were able to respond to the crisis in credit that the overthrow of the Ancien Regime brought about precisely because of a communications revolution in the, 18th, in the late uh, 18th and early 19th centuries. This revolution was based on two things. First, the development of cheap rag paper, which made the printing of newspapers and journals extremely cheap and effective and, and efficient. Secondly, it had to do with the mode of production of print media. At the time, it was incredibly decentralized. It wasn't very expensive to uh, open up a newspaper. So you had a load, uh, a vast number of small, privately owned, decentralized newspapers and journals. And the number of them just mushroomed between about 1780 and about 1840. I mean, it was just all over the place on both uh, the continent and the United States. Now, these media, these newspapers and journals, which were almost always, which were very often profoundly partisan, served as intermediaries between, on the one hand, literate publics that had emerged with this culture of rational discourse, and the realm of politics. And they supplied a venue for the diffusion of ideologies, um, which, and it's important to note, ideologies both reported the way the world was. right? That's what newspaper reporting did, ideological newspaper reporting. It tells you the way the world is, and then gives you, that's its report, and then gives you a command, what we should do next to make it better, to fix things. So there's, there's both sides of this. This is important because social science does the same thing. What social science does is it defocalizes its commands and focalizes its reports. Ideology does the opposite. It, it, it also reports, but it's most primarily concerned with its commands. But the, the larger point I want to make about the communications revolution that Guldner makes is that the rationality and uh, origin, then, of ideology are tied up not just with print, but obviously with writing. Why is this important? Writing is a decontextualized form of communication. When you have oral discourse with someone, it is not necessary to make all assumptions explicit or to spell out every point. Your gestures, your, uh, the, the context in which you're speaking makes clear a lot of what you're after. Right? I mean, when people speak orally, their sentences are much shorter. Their examples are much more concrete. They tend to be much less abstract. Writing is decontextualized. You don't know who the speaker is. You don't know exactly what the context he's referring to is. Everything has to be made out and explicit. And that, therefore, it's the ideal medium for the culture of rational discourse. And I mention this because very briefly, I don't have time to develop this, but Guldner suggests that subsequent communications revolutions may undermine ideology. 
right? Visual media may remove us from a written world, which may in fact de-ideologize us to some extent. Now, turn back to the major fish we want to fry. Ideologies unmask each other. They do this by exposing the hidden or occluded interests that lie behind uh, a, a particular ideology. Okay, so the Marxist critiques bourgeois ideology by saying, well, the bourgeois ideologist is not disinterested. He's, in fact, speaking for the capitalist class. He tells you that private property is the necessary condition for civilization precisely because he's speaking for the, the class that owns the vast bulk of private property. That's his interest. So it's not a disembodied rationality that's speaking through him. He's hiding what his real hidden uh, um, basis, agenda, and project is. So what Marxism then does and all ideologies do this to one another, is they recontextual, recontextualize each other, Marxism in particular with political economy, as an ideology by showing and uncovering its biases and class interests. And in fact, that's just what Marx did with classical political economy, is he said this is not a science, it's really just an ideology. It takes as given the very elements that make up the basis of a bourgeois culture, private property. Now, that then suggests what the limit of the rationality of an ideology is. Each ideology's rationality is limited because it claims to be, unlike all of its competitors, completely disinterested. Right? Each ideologist is the only person who has no prior agenda, who has no particular class interests, who is speaking for humanity as a whole. And they just all ideologies deny their basic weakness, that they are determined by the interests of both their formulators, the ideologue, and their adherents people who believe in it. Now, ideology shares this flaw with, quote, value-free social science. But it's particularly damning in ideology because ideology's, quote, unity of theory and practice gives rise to fanaticism. Okay. Since ideology is a variant of the culture of rational discourse with its fixation on public objectivity and uh, rule-bound inference, it's profoundly tied up with those persons who are immersed in that culture. In other words, not everyone is equally exposed and immersed in the culture of rational discourse. Some people do it as a vocation. Some people occasionally engage in it. Some people never at all. Thus, it's not sociologically coincidental that ideologies do very well on college campuses and do very well among educated people because they appeal to that culture of rationality which they are trained in when they get to higher education. It has a ideologies have a profound appeal for people who, quote, are cultural workers, people in the arts and in the humanities, and to some extent in the sciences. This also raises the possibility of a ideological unmasking of Marxism itself. And we'll get to this, but I want to lay out the problem, the problem uh, right here. How is it that this social science of Marxism, which claims to be the ideology of the proletariat, is first revealed and reported and then overwhelmingly sustained by trained academicians and others who are immersed in the modern culture of rational discourse. Why is it that if Marxism is the consciousness of the proletariat, it is written by someone who did a PhD on Aristotle and is held, uh, Marxist revolutionaries being largely people who have PhDs in law. Right? Very few proletarians actually have led any revolutions. This brings us to the second, and what I'm going to treat as the central text, this very thin future of intellectuals and the rise of the new class. And it deals with the fundamental flaws in the Marxist scenario, the Marxist scenario of class struggle. The Marxist scenario was just wrong, right? Revolutions did not, in fact, occur when they did, social revolutions, in advanced industrial economies between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Just the opposite. They occurred largely in backward economies, and they rarely ever involved the proletariat. Overwhelmingly, they involved the peasantry. That's nowhere in Marxism. More importantly, the peasantry, in every case, was mobilized by vanguard parties, parties made up of professional Marxist intellectuals, who, who incidentally play no role in traditional Marxist theory. So in its own account of revolution, the Marxist scenario was just completely wrong. And that's because what Marxism is occluding and covering is the possibility that the real class struggle of the modern ethic is between the old class, the moneyed bourgeoisie, on the one hand, and the new class made up of, well, let's look at two particular strata. One, a new class of technical intelligentsia, 
which has grown in incredible numbers in the last 100 years. Who do I mean by this? Engineers, doctors, lawyers, dentists, CEOs of corporations who don't necessarily own stock in their businesses, but are paid MBAs. Uh, a whole co host of people whose income is derived from their higher education rather than their ownership of the means of production. The size of this class has been the largest growing group in society, Western societies, over the last hundred years. It is the class that benefits from post-industrial society. It is the information age uh, class. It is the class that rides on this information superhighway. That and another strata of that group, which is the traditional humanistic intellectuals, who Gouldner thinks have been there for quite some time. So that may, in fact, be the real class struggle going on in the modern period between those groups, the moneyed and the educated. Now this, in fact, in many ways, fits with the traditional theory of class struggle. I mean, Marx pulled a real quickie in the Communist Manifesto. It says the history of Human history has been the history of class struggles. Master against slave, peasant uh, against uh, uh, lord against serf, bourgeois against proletariat. Well, the quickie is nowhere in the rest of Marx's writings will you find that formulation. That's never the way, in fact, when he looks at the actual class struggles, they worked. They were always between an old elite and a new arising elite. It was really between Roman patricians and the new arising class of knights. It was really between feudal lords, and not the serfs or peasants, but the new and arising class of burghers, the bourgeoisie. Thus, for the modern epic, it would be between the old bourgeoisie and the new and emerging new class of intellectuals and intelligentsia. And then this uh, sheds light on, in fact, Marxist revolutions. In Marxist revolutions, Marxist revolutionaries mobilize peasants or workers through ideologies ideologies which appeal to the interests of those workers and peasants and include the interests, hide the interests of uh, the revolutionaries themselves as a cultural bourgeoisie, as people who own high culture, who have some interest in uh, the culture of rationality. Um, and this is, in fact, why Marxism was never able to account for itself, right? Because it is, in part, at least, at least in part, an ideology of a revolutionary uh, intelligentsia that's using the working class to overthrow its bourgeois rival and seize control of state and economic power. This sheds great light because think of actual socialist regimes that have existed. And forget the Marxist claim that, well, they're flawed and defective, because the bourgeois theorists can make the same claim about present capitalist societies. Who actually runs those things? Lenin was a worker? Now he had a PhD in law. Trotsky was a peasant? No, actually, while he was fighting the civil wars, he popped off and said, I just finished my book fighting these civil wars on revolutionary aesthetic theory. Che Guevara, he's a doctor. Um, Mao Zedong, well, no, he's actually a school teacher. Uh, in every case, it fits the pattern of, of, you know, of this revolutionary activity. In fact, why is it that so many cultured people loved Gorbachev? Because he was one of us. He was an egghead. His wife was a, loved art. I mean, he was, I think, an, an engineer. In fact, if you joined the party in the, well, there was the Soviet Union, you either went to college, or if you hadn't gone to college, they sent you to college. And all of those premiers, whether they were meatheads or not, always had the title of engineer or professor or something like that. Okay. In fact, if you looked at the first Politburo or Central Committee, it would have been a collection of the leading intellects of Russia at the time, at least those that were radical. OK. Now, the class struggle in the West, obviously, is not revolutionary. Right? The, the professionals and, and business executives who don't own the means of production and, and lawyers and teachers and professors aren't calling for violent revolution in the streets. But even here, it's apparent that there is a struggle going on. Think of, in the 1980s, the uh, mania and criticism of people like T. Boone Pickens. Uh, the period of corporate takeovers. What was their fundamental argument? The people who run corporations don't owe them, own them. They're a class of professional intelligentsia who have no interest in maximizing profit. That's not their goal. They are not serving the old class. They've taken over. There's been a revolution. And in fact, that's what Galbraith had argued, that capitalism has become great because owners no longer control anything. It's controlled by enlightened technocrats. Um, it's also uh, evident in, in political divisions. There's no question, at least in Guldner's mind, that the Republican Party is dominated by the old class. 
by the bourgeoisie, by the National Association of Manufacturers. Right? That's who backs the Republican Party. But who backs the Democratic Party? The educated, the most educated elite. I mean, Seymour Martin Lipset did brilliant research into academics. And guess what? The higher you get into uh, the academy, the more prestige in terms of humanistic intellectuals, the farther they move to the left. As you get to the very apex at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, they become radical socialists and communists. But most of them are just left liberals. Right? They overwhelmingly vote Democratic. So it, it, it's apparent there as well. Now, in this class struggle, the new class has advantages in its struggle with the bourgeoisie over that of, say, the proletariat or lumpen proletariat. Why? They control technical skill, without which the bourgeoisie can't, quote, revolutionize the means of production. They can't do without them. Therefore, uh, although there may be an overproduction of them at points, they demand relatively uh, substantial incomes, particularly compared to regular uh, blue-collar workers. Now, part of what constitutes this class, this new class, is its human or cultural capital, right? It derives income based on uh, something it's learned, it, skills it has it, it gained. Um, but part of what unifies it as well is that shared culture of critical discourse, that culture of rational discourse, which s serves as a sort of uh, underlying ideology for it. This culture of critical discourse, as he puts it in this book, or rational discourse in the previous one, makes it feel that it's somehow epistemologically superior to all other classes because it's more rational. It thinks through problems more clearly. Um, and therefore, it has a superior claim to social rectitude insofar as its beliefs are predicated on, again, voluntary assent, uh, are free of an appeal to authority, um, or the social position of the speaker. Because it's more rational, it's better able to get at the truth and therefore is politically superior. It is, in a sense, the modern equivalent of the Greek logos, right? disembodied logic, which speaks in our ear like a muse. And it's that which gives intellectuals and intelligentsia the right which they feel they have in both socialist and capitalist societies to conceive of themselves as the contemporary equivalent of platonic philosopher kings, people who just know better, experts who have more insight and gives them, in Gouldner's phrase, a platonic con complex. And very often, I mean, if you listen to um, educated expositors on public affairs, they'll simply refer to uh, people who disagree with them, with them as unenlightened or ill-informed, as if somehow they're, they're just not in a position to know. They're, they're not guardian class material as we are. Now, having said all these criticisms of the new class, I, I want to point out Gouldner does nonetheless think this new class is although flawed, a flawed universal class. In other words, OK, it's certainly jealous of its prerogatives. It has an unbearable will to power and arrogance and hubris. It thinks it is the bee's knees. Um, but at the same time, it is committed to public rationality because of its culture of critical discourse. And it's also, because of that, committed to some measure of social justice. And it's also committed to a constant critique of authority. So while it's flawed, it may be better and more rational than any of the other classes that history has generated. It may be, in Gouldner's phrase, the best card history has left to play. And he says, while they're certainly not taking over yet, except in that part of the world which is socialist, uh, and he did not live to see the fall of the, the Soviet empire, um, he sees, look at the secular trend from 1890 to 1980 the decline of the old class and the rise of the new class. And there's no question in his mind that it is ultimately fated for victory. And he raises things like, this is an excellent example. Take the ecology movement. Who does that appeal to? The working class constituents that back the ecology movement don't exist. They lose their jobs because of the ecology movement. When you start saying we, we have to cut down the pollution of, of, the, of, the, of streams from steel mills, steel workers lose their jobs. We can't pollute the air with sulfur. Chemical workers lose their jobs. We have to save the spotted owl. Timber workers lose their jobs. They're not in favor of it. The business class isn't in favor of it. They lose money. Who's in favor of it? I am. <laughs> People like me. Right? And he says that's an example of why we may be a, 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 a universal class. Ecology actually is necessary. We are polluting the planet. And it's only people uh, who have this disembodied rationality who are likely to see it. Now, what light does this shed on? Um, Marxism and what I would call Marxology, Marxology being the study of Marxism. Well, traditional Marxology distinguishes between two, two forms of Marxism, critical and scientific. 
Critical Marxism is found in Marx's early Hegelian and Romantic writings. Um, it's also found in most 20th century Marxists in their voluntarism, their belief in free will, uh, figures like Lenin, uh, Gramsci, Georg Lukács, Jürgen Habermas, the Frankfurt School. All of these figures are critical Marxists. They're Hegelians. They're working with critique. On the other hand is the scientific Marxism that's associated with Das Kapital, well, found in Marx's later writings. And it's, uh, it's found in subsequent writers known as economistic writers, people who believe that Marxism was a science and that the revolution was inevitable. It was, you didn't have to do anything to promote it. Uh, it's found in uh, the structuralism of the French uh, structuralist Marxist Louis Althusser and in uh, the positivistic techno-determinism of, of Gerald Cohen in, in Britain. Each of these traditions argues that it's the real Marxism and the other one's some sort of bizarre distortion. The critical Marxists say, well, the others are bizarre positivists. And the scientific Marxists say, well, they're just strange literary critics who think they're Marxists. Marxism is a science, a science of society. Now, Gulder argues that this um, dispute exists precisely because there is, in fact, a disparity in Marx's work between the early and late. And not only that, it reflects different interests within the Marxist project, as well as different interpretations of uh, uh, Marx's writings. Interests which are either, on the one hand, humanistic, we want to be a shepherd in the morning and a critic in the afternoon. Or technical, we want to understand the laws of economic development. What Gulner does is he says, let's think of the division of Marx's oeuvre in different terms. In terms of, think of Marx's work as a theory. In the same way, and he's profoundly influenced by the work of, of, of Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, think of it as a paradigm. And let's look at sociologically, the sociological process of paradigm and theory construction. In this conception, theories or paradigms are a sort of intellectual property that theorists construct and then make claim to. So Marx then, uh, and, and Marx and Engels and Marxism went through three phases in theory construction. In the first phase, Marx drew together the basic elements of his paradigm, what is known as historical materialism. The problem of scarcity, the ubiquity of class struggle, the proletariat as a universal class, the state withering away eventually, all those things which are contained in our uh, lecture on Marxism. And this period probably culminates somewhere around 1848 when he writes the Manifesto. It's at this moment when they lay out their basic and uh, most fundamental liniments of their theory that Marx and Engels are the most critical and that they spend a lot of their time criticizing other socialisms and criticizing other writings. This is when Marx writes The Poverty of Philosophy, when he critiques utopian socialism, when he writes against British political economy. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to show, I have something new here. It looks like political economy, but it's not like the other stuff. That's bogus. This is real political economy. It looks like socialism, but the other socialisms aren't real socialism. This is real socialism here. So he's basically trying to mark out, look, I've got, I've got some new property here. I want copyright rights. Um, the next step, the second phase of, for Marx and Engels, and this is the one that's ignored in traditional Marxology, is they attempt to apply this new paradigm to cases. They look at examples. Things like the Grundrisse, the civil wars in France, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, and their various uh, writings back and forth about the problems of uh, the Asiatic mode of production. Okay. There are some anomalies that start to be generated in this paradigm, as is the case with all paradigms. What are they? Well, let's look at the class struggles in France. Uh, they begin to take on a chaotic element. Um, particularly in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, it's not clear that the struggle is between labor and capital, after all. I mean, at first he says that, and then he says, well, you know, it may really be between the peasantry and the bourgeoisie. Yeah, that's what it really is. It's countryside against town. And he says, no, no, no. It's really the lumpen proletariat against the bourgeoisie. This is the rise of a sort of crypto-fascism. And then finally he's forced to say, you know what? It may actually be the state itself. The state may not just be a superstructural element of the economy. The state may be an independent agency that's trying to create its own control over society. This is completely anomalous with the Marxist theory. And he's just pushing these possibilities around. In the Asiatic mode of production, what, what that refers to is 
Marxism has great difficulty dealing with anything that's not European. The reason is, if one looks at the classical economy of China or even India, there are no property classes. All of the land is owned by the government. People have a right, you know, the lords who are lords, have a right to their land because of the services they fulfill. But they don't own it, nor are the peasants. The government owns it. People have a right to take a certain amount of their income from it. Mandarin officials have a right to take a certain amount of the income from it, and the rest goes on to the government. So, and that becomes a real problem for Marxism, because there not only do you not have property classes, but you certainly have some sort of civilization and economy, you also have a state which is not the servant of the ruling classes, just the opposite. The dominant classes are the servant of the state. So as, this, as he starts to explore these anomalies, the theory starts to become unhinged. Marxism ceases to make quite so much sense as historical materialism had developed it. Um, and, and then Marx turns from it. He turns his back to it and says, no, let's go back to the classic paradigm. And that's what he developed in Das Kapital. Right? He works it out in his purest case. And he starts looking at paradigm cases, the places where it works the best. England, thoroughly bourgeois, thoroughly property classes. The United States works perfectly. Okay. Now, the final period from about 1872 to the deaths of Marx and Engels is one of theory consolidation. Having written Capital, he's turned his back on the anomalies. He's looked, they're just, they're not really there, they're not important. They're just sort of glitches. Rather than modify the theory to fit the anomalies, instead what they do is they defend their theory against vulgarizations. That's when he writes anti during that's when he uh, critiques uh, vulgar economisms. And uh, they fend off anomalies in accord, in the same way that Kuhn says uh, any, any any paradigm fends off its anomalies through normal science, tries to argue them away, or throw in extra principles to account for them, or if they can't do that, say, well, the anomalies aren't such a big deal. The rest of the theory is sufficiently explanatory. Now, it's this third period, or this second period, excuse me, the period of paradigm application, that transitional phase, that Guldner thinks is the most interesting in the construction of any theory, particularly Marxism. It's the most interesting and it's the most fruitful, and it's particularly important uh, because for Marxism, the anomalies it generates, um, which Marx and Marxism subsequently ignore, are emblematic of what could be called the structural elements, uh, structural flaws within Marxism itself. Well, l let's rehash what those were. The first was that the state might not just be an instrument of the ruling class, that it might actually be a separate agency, a separate realm of power. Why is that such a big deal? This is very threatening because if it's true, that this, then it's possible that under communism, the state might not, as Marx thought, just wither away of itself, because it has no function, since there is no longer any classes. Consider why that's important. Marx said that when you have the revolution, the first thing you do is centralize the government, make it super powerful. And that's not a danger to human freedom, because once we've done away with classes, it'll just disappear. But suppose the state doesn't disappear, then what do you have? The super centralized government. What we call totalitarianism, right? In other words, Stalinism might not be a uh, uh, aberration from Marxism. It might be an aberration within Marxism. Okay. Um, the second anomaly is that not all classes might be property. We saw this with the Asiatic mode of production. It is not necessary for a class to own the means of production, or for a ruling class to own the means of production. The state can own it. Um, in the Asiatic mode of production, in classical China or India, distinct classes exist without proprietary control of the means of production, which, at least nominally, is under the control of the government. If that's the case, then Marxism, as a theory of proprietary classes, of property classes, is, uh, exclusively applies to Northwestern Europe. Because even in Central and Eastern Europe, there is a mixture of property and non property classes. Eastern European feudalism involves not a true um, a beneficed uh, fiefed uh, um, aristocracy, but a service aristocracy. They don't inherit their land. They take their land because they are servants of the, uh, the, the Tsar, and they can lose it if their children don't take the, the oath of loyalty. Um, that means that even Northeastern Europe, in fact, might possibly contain non-proprietary classes, and the most obvious of which would be intellectuals and intelligentsia, that Marx might have missed a uh, class in his analysis. You put these anomalies together, and they constitute the basis of something Guldner calls nightmare Marxism. 
Every theory has hidden within it a nightmare, something it's afraid of, its worst possibility. Now, Marxism is no exception. It's the hidden subterranean fears that Marx and Engels have to turn their back on. It's a way to keep sane. Well, the first and most trivial fear is, with these anomalies, since the anomalies violate the rule, the theory, Marxism might turn out to have not been a science after all. It's just another utopian socialism of which he had contempt. It's just another idealistic belief in human equality. It is, as Cardinal Newman said, the last Christian heresy where the meek shall inherit the earth, which Marx thought was, you know, if, if you couldn't find a scientific basis for it, it surely sounds silly, the meek inherit. They never have before. It's like lambs lying down with lions, you know. Lions will love that. They don't have to run very far to have lunch. Um, that's a trivial fear, however. The deeper fear, the real nightmare, is that Marxism, as a theory of proprietary classes, has failed to see that it was Europe's unique experience, and Northwestern Europe in particular, its unique experience with proprietary classes and with private property that led to its Promethean dynamism. I mean, think back to Marx's historical materialism. The reason that the revolution has to occur there is History has to solve the problem of scarcity. There has to be more than enough for everyone. That problem comes close to being solved with industrialism in the West because the bourgeoisie constantly revolutionize the means of production. They're constantly in investing in research and development. We're constantly changing uh, and increasing our power over nature. Well, it might be the case with these anomalies that that's only true because Northwestern Europe has proprietary classes. And they have an interest in revolutionizing the means of production. That might explain why capitalism emerges in the Hanseatic League, in England, in France, but not in China, not in India, not in Eastern Europe. If that's true, and Marx is a big fan of this revolutioniz re revolutionization of the means of production, because if you don't do that, you just share poverty equally. And he thinks that's ridiculous. Better off to just have at least a couple people happy than everyone miserable. Um, if you can't have this Promethean dynamism, revolution's a bad idea. In fact, in this nightmare, proprietary classes turn out to be a necessary condition for the dynamic revolutionizing uh, of the means of production. That is unique to contemporary Western capitalism. Therefore, the abolition of private property doesn't really eliminate scarcity after all. It doesn't make us shepherds in the morning and critics in the afternoon. What it does is it ushers in an industrial version of that static, Asiatic mode of production, which never changes, is fixed and based on eternal verities, and with it, because it's got a super new powerful state which owns everything, a new Oriental despotism. Deep within nightmare Marxism is the possibility of a static, gray, dull, Soviet social society, a society, or a static, gray, dull, Maoist China. I, I think particularly of one image uh, which um, I've seen, uh, which really affected, um, who was it, Nixon when he went to China. He, he spoke in a place, and there was his audience of young students, each one dressed identically to the other in the exact same gray uniform with the exact same cap. And he looked out and he said, God, these people are powerful, scary, and frightening. Each one is an interchangeable unit. Marxism, uh, this humanistic freeing of, of, of the, uh, the, the man's inner potential, might turn out to just mean that, a new form of Oriental despotism, a return to that which, made Europe, you know, which Europe broke from, which made Europe exciting, Promethean, dynamic, a realm of freedom. Well, I want to talk briefly in the remaining moments about Gulner's legacy. What it is we can take from this project, from the dark side of the dialectic. It's a vast project. It's a vast resource. I've only touched, skimmed the tip of the iceberg, certain elements in this uh, series of texts. Um, those which I find particularly compelling, which I thought I could put into a, a unitary whole. But there's much more going on here. There is a, a rich analysis of the distinction between academic sociology in the Chicago School and the critical Frankfurt School of criticism uh, uh, and Marxist uh, ideology found uh, in Europe, in people like Adorno, uh, 
Marcuse, Horkheimer, and then later in Jürgen Habermas. There is as well an a evaluation of the distinction between value-free social science and its tendency towards technocracy, its downside, and ideology with its moral appeal, and its downside being the potential for fanaticism, making fanaticism a virtue. For me, or at least it seems to me, one way that a general public might look at Gulner is to first see his commitment to Marxism as itself contingent. Right? That's his, his own personal decision. He happens to be a Marxist, even of the outlaw variety. That's his own uh, choice, and that's not necessarily part of the project we have to pick up. Um, it's a matter of his own moral conscience, would be another way of putting it. But it's, it's his discussion, at least as I conceive it, of the role of intellectuals and intelligentsia that affords us a fundamental transformation in not only social theory, um, but also in the theory of, or, or the process of theory construction, the process of philosophic construction. And it also sheds light on important problems in the sociology of knowledge, uh, as well as political and cultural history. Well, how so? The historical implications of Guldner's findings may be even more profound than he thought. Consider um, not only how much of contemporary political dispute is based on struggles between an educated elite and those outside of it, the debate over funding for the NEA. Uh, obviously, as someone who has received NEH founding, funding, uh, I'm all for it. But uh, you know, an argument could be made that it doesn't necessarily serve the interests of either of the other classes in society. Why is our government uh, subsidizing that? Um, I, not to say we shouldn't. We certainly should. I need the money. But um, the case could be made. But more profoundly, what Gulder may have overlooked is that while professional engineers, a technical intelligentsia, may in fact be a fairly new phenomenon in the last 100 years, that older strata of humanistic intellectuals go all the way back, the beginning of history, nor are all intelligentsia technical. Consider, let, let's think of, think of a way to define these people. Intellectuals might be people who have assimilated high culture and produced some of it of their own. That's, in fact, the PhD requirement. You've got to write a book. And by high culture, I don't mean good culture. I mean just really stuff that follows that culture of rational discourse, really abstract stuff. It can be incredibly dull. You can write a horrible dissertation. But as long as it meets the canons, you've created new high culture. Maybe bad high culture, but new high culture. Intelligentsia, on the other hand, have to learn that stuff, but they don't create more of the new stuff. They just apply it to particular problems. Well, lawyers are intelligentsia. They learn legal theory and apply it in cases. Doctors are intelligentsia. They've been around for quite a time. Theologians are intellectuals, but priests are intelligentsia, as are ministers. They've been around for quite some time. So this class may not be as new as Guldner thinks. Far from a new class, in fact, they may well, with the peasant, be the oldest class in world history. Consider the first city-states. Two classes emerge right away. The first civilizations start out with a class of farmers and a class of priests who do the writing and, to, and are technical intelligentsia. They, say, they tell you when to flood the fields, when to collect the harvests, and how much of it to give us, the government. Right? We may not be a new class. We may be the oldest class in history. In that sense, we might look at the history of moral philosophy in a different light. Moral philosophy might be all about the Platonic complex. Certainly one of the freaky things, freakish things, that happened in Greece, as opposed to all the civilizations that preceded, it, is it's actually a low civilization. All of the others are dominated by priests, priests and bureaucrats. Greece is overrun, the Minoan Greeks, by barbarians. It's dominated by aristocratic horsemen who claim, who don't know how to read and write, and say, this is my land, and if you want to work on it, you're going to give me some of it. I own things now. Philosophy grew up in an environment in which it never got, the intellectual never had the power that he had originally aspired to, that he'd had in Egypt, in Sumer, in India, and in China. Therefore, what does he write in his philosophy? What does Plato say? We have to change society. The problem is people who own things run too much too many things. We need to go back to the rule of philosopher kings. The deep structure of this old class may be what Marx called Oriental despotism. <laughs>